Welcome to In Focus. I'm Loretta Beniti. We're on the road this week coming to you from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. We're kicking off our four week debate series partnership with the Institute for Political Leadership. We'd also like to thank our debate sponsors this year. That's the North Carolina Sheriff's Association, the Conservatives for Criminal Justice Reform, the ACLU of North Carolina and Nelson Mullins. This year, we will focus all of our debates on criminal justice reform in North Carolina. Our topic today will be capital punishment in our state. Our topic today will be juvenile justice reform. Our topic today will be the role of the prosecutor. This year, we are focusing our debates on the issue of criminal justice reform. Our topic today is going to be police reform. Before we begin, let's go over the rules for the debate. I will direct each question to a specific panelist for a one minute answer, after which the other three will also have one minute to answer. Then there will be a two minute rebuttal period during which I may ask a follow up question if necessary. After the discussion for our question is complete, we will move on to a new question and a new panelist. Let's start by introducing you to the members of tonight's panel. First, we have Senator Mujtaba Muhammad. He is a Democrat serving his second term from Mecklenburg County. He got his law degree from North Carolina Central University. Next is Senator Amy Scott Gailey. She is a Republican ser serving Alamance in Guilford counties in her first term in the Senate. She got her law degree from UNC Chapel Hill. Kerwin Pittman is with Emancipate NC. He is a social justice advocate and sits on the North Carolina Task Force for Racial Equity and Criminal Justice. And Sheriff Clarence Burkhead, prior to being elected sheriff in Durham County, he served as the chief of police in two jurisdictions and has over three decades of law enforcement experience. Uh, sheriff Burkhead received his master's degree in organizational management from Pfeiffer University. And with that, we are ready to begin our debate. First question is going to go to you, Senator Muhammad. I want to start with a baseline tonight. What do you define as police reform? And do you believe that we need it across the board here in North Carolina? Well, first of all, Loretta, thank you so much for having me in this wonderful esteemed panel. And thank you so much for having this critical conversation that so many folks are having, not only uh, in places like Wake County in North Carolina, but across the country. Um, look, police reform is absolutely critical. I think it's about uh, when you give a group of individuals, an institution, the responsibility to serve and protect and be guardians of a community, you want to make sure you have a sense of accountability, transparency, and trust. Uh, so I think communities across, whether it's Charlotte, Mecklenburg, where I come from, whether it's Raleigh, Wake County, or any part of this state, I think folks want basic decency, transparency, accountability in law enforcement so we can build a cooperative relationship with the community and the police. Uh, so you're seeing a lot of movements at doing exactly that, especially because real lives are at stake. Um, throughout the summer, after the murder of George Floyd, you saw protests across not only our state, but across the country, even parts of the world asking for more police accountability and trust uh, because they have a critical role uh, and it's important to have them uh, be at the table to work together to create a safer community for all of us. Okay. Senator Gailey, same question to you. Thank you so much and I'll say yes, thank you very much for having us tonight. Um, I would define police, I would think about police reform in the context of any career, any profession. Um, we wouldn't treat our cancer the way we did 30 years ago. We wouldn't look at um, most professions the way we have in the past. I think, like other professions, policing should be continually renewed, continually updated, continually refreshed, so that we can learn from the past and adapt and look forward to the future and make sure that what is happening with our law enforcement is reflecting what's going on in our society. As far as needing police reform right now across the board in North Carolina, I think it's extremely important to recognize and acknowledge the tremendous efforts that are being made in local governments, in city councils with their police departments, in county commissions working with their elected sheriffs to adapt and uh, refresh with the times. There's so much work being done with mental health, um, with uh, other kinds of reform, with uh, uh, attending to the needs of the people who come into contact with the jail system. Um, there's so much that's already happening that across the board in North Carolina. I think tonight, I hope, will be a good time to uh, get to dig into that and have some discussion about what's happening on the local level already. Okay, Mr. Pittman. Um, thank you for having me on this esteemed panel first. Um, and police reform across the board is definitely 
um, needed right now in our current um, state. Um, since the brutal murder of George Floyd kind of put a spotlight on the importance of this reform, but this reform was definitely needed before um, the brutal murder of George Floyd. Um, and if we had this type of reform in place in North Carolina, um, we would make sure that true transparency and accountability um, will be had when it comes to law enforcement um, across the state of North Carolina. So um, like any other thing in any other profession, it must evolve. And so reform is just reimagining public safety in a way that the community um, has an actual stake in what's going on inside these professions and a say in what's going on inside these professions. Um, since after all, these individuals are the ones who are being policed, especially those in marginalized communities. Um, so I always believe that those who are closest to the pain should be closest to the power. Um, and we must center those marginalized communities and voices and pains and, and, and trauma and stories um, to create different policies and reforms reflecting these so they will not continue to be um, brutalized. Okay, and Sheriff Burkhead. Thank you, and what a pleasure to be here tonight with all of the panelists. The short answer for me is yes. Uh, we are in need of police reform, and as everyone has already stated, the time is now. We must engage in policing that is transparent, uh, that is dependable, and that that really answers to the people. Uh, as a sheriff and representing the North Carolina Sheriff's Association, we are servant leaders and it, it is up to us to lead the way. I'm really happy to say that we've had these conversations at the North Carolina Sheriff's Association. We're talking about how we can raise the level of professionalism uh, and building strong relationships within communities is exactly what a sheriff does. Uh, sometimes we do it every four years or sometimes we do it continuously uh, because we are elected officials but building those relationships is the only way that I think we can truly have police reform. Law enforcement has to be at the table, chiefs of police have to be at the table, legislators and community activists must be at the table to engage in the conversation jointly so that we can, as Mr. Pittman said, those who have been marginalized need to be in the conversation as well, and we can hear from them and make sure we're on the right track. Okay. We're going to move on to the next question, and it's going to build off of uh, what Representative Jones just said. What age is the right age to start putting juveniles into detention centers if they've broken the law? And what, what's too young, and why is it too young? Thanks, Loretta. It's a question that has been debated much, and uh, at NC Child, we this past year, we were very encouraged to see the minimum age raised up to 10 years old, except for egregious felonies for eight and nine year olds, which very rarely happens. We feel like the fact that prior to this, we were prosecuting six and seven year olds was just totally uncalled for. And when you look at all of the research and data, it shows that they can't competently understand what's going on in that criminal justice system for them. Um, we felt like that was a good compromise and it's a great step forward. And we're glad North Carolina took it. I think that a lot of the research shows that actually the age of like 14 is probably uh, a mark that we at NC Child would be looking towards because again, when you look at the brain development, the competency to go before a judge and understand the consequences of actions and such, there's lots of data that has shown us that actually there's a lot of children under that age that don't really qualify under those parameters. So uh, other states have minimum ages that are higher than North Carolina's now. We feel like we've taken a step in the right direction and we wanna keep pushing the envelope because again, the idea is getting the services to the individual, to that child, to that family. And what we really need to be doing with so many of these situations with younger children is getting them the mental health services that they need. And that's a whole other point to be talked about. Okay, Ms. Mitchell. So your, your question was, what is the right age for detention? And I think that that is a very hard question. It seemed like it could be a really straightforward quick answer question, but I don't think it's an easy question to answer really. I think that, you know, you really have to, just like you, Representative Jones said, um, you have to really look at what is the crime that is been, has been alleged to have been committed and then look to the age and then look to what is going on with that child, their mental health, um, you know, what other needs do they have? So I don't know if it, you know, I wouldn't want to just say 
this particular age is the best age for a kid to be in detention. There, the statute requires that the judge look at all different types, number of factors to determine whether or not a child should be placed in detention. And so I think those are good factors to start with. And so they, they, you would definitely have to look at, like I said, the, the crime itself. Um, but you, detention as the first option should never be. It should never be the first option just solely based on the type of crime either. So I'm not saying that, you know what I mean? So I, I just don't think that you can really put a concrete number on when it would be appropriate to put a child in detention. Clearly, if you have some seriously violent crime that's been alleged to have been committed, that particular child, I don't like to refer to our, our um, young people as juveniles, um, but that, that particular child um, has been alleged to have committed a very serious crime. They're a, safe, they're a threat to the safety of the community. They may be a threat to themselves and those kinds of things. That's when you need to start looking at detention. But otherwise, detention should not be a first option for any age. Okay, Representative Jones. Well, I, I would uh, I would agree with uh, Ms. Mitchell. I, I thank you. When you get these arbitrary numbers, that's easy to sell from the punitive point of view. But it doesn't sell very well when it comes to human beings. Uh, I, I was on the bench for 17 years, Superior Court. And you just see so many gradations. The facts are really, really important. So when, you come to ha when it comes to handling young people, um, we need to dig deeper. I, I, I don't think there's any case where I would say I handled where, where the juvenile case had come into, somehow gotten into Superior Court, that I didn't dig deeper. You got to dig deeper. You have to be committed to that. So it's hard to pick an age. Um, I think that, you know, I, 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 14, 15, you know, and I, I, in there somewhere, but it, it's very difficult. I, I, I think I'd like to stay away from a number if I could, to be honest with you. Mr. Murray. Well, most states do that. And in 29 states, there's no minimum. In 29 states, there's no minimum age for prosecution, which means five and six-year-olds in 29 states can be prosecuted uh, through the juvenile process. And so North Carolina picked an age. And, and we, we, for states that do pick an age, we're in the majority of that age now. And, and so I think, um, I, I think when you're looking at this, you've got to take some inter incremental uh, steps to achieve the right balance. And I think that's, that's really the point you're, you were making, is this facts make the determination on how you handle this case. And if there is a victim involved and it's violent, that changes everything. That changes everything. And that's what we did when you raised the age of juvenile prosecution. And that's, what, that's the consideration that the General Assembly made this year when, when raising the minimum. I thought you were about to go Michael Jordan on us and the roof and the, the ceiling. Oh, that, was, that was really good. Uh, but uh, um, when we raised the floor to 10 except for uh, A through G felonies. Okay. Let's move on to the next question, Ms. Mitchell. This one's going to come to you first. Studies show that far greater numbers of juveniles of color are in the juvenile justice system than there are percentage-wise in the general population. We see that same trend when it comes to the adult correction system as well. What steps need to be taken to realign those statistics? Ooh, a lot. First, I think that there needs to be racial equity and implicit bias training for all folks involved in the criminal justice system, starting with or going from law enforcement to court counselors to judges, clerks, court counselors, everybody that is involved, the attorneys, everyone that's involved in the juvenile or the just criminal justice system and in, i.e., the um, juvenile system that is going to work with that child or come into contact with any child, they should have that kind of training because we already know that all of that, the, the arrest or the detention even, because you know a lot of children are, a lot of them are not arrested. So they're just detained. And even in that situation, that officer's implicit bias or their prejudice or whatever else that they come to the table with is going to have a, play a huge factor into whether or not they divert this child or if divert as in 
put them through some other program that bypasses the, the criminal justice system or juvenile court process, or if they're gonna file a complaint with the court counselor for that child to have to go through the court system. And so I think that is the first step. I think that is important for everybody. And I think that's important for all courts, not ju just criminal justice in general and not just juvenile justice, but I would say that would be the first step. Okay, Representative Jones, same question to you. Well, um, I think the first thing we have to recognize is that racism, racism still exists in our society. If people are gonna tell you it doesn't, they're just not telling you the truth. Uh, it affects law enforcement in a big way. Uh, but I think we have to treat it in such a way that we still wanna attract our young people to go into law enforcement. We need good, solid minority officers. We have to have them because they maybe can then bring the lens that minority people look at things. Not that uh, non-minority people can't look at things fairly, but that has to be acknowledged and it has to be worked at. The moment we try to pretend it doesn't exist anymore, it being racism, it becomes a joke because it absolutely does. And so, and then we should approach it on each officer and keep the stats uh, and keep the numbers and the training I agree with too in this. We have to keep working at it. 